Um, it's a great resource. If you guys don't know about it, check it out. And so to begin extracting this element, the best way to extract it is by using the color channels here. So we have a red, green, and blue channels. And what we're looking for is the color channel that offers the most contrast between what we want to extract and the background. So the highest contrast between you know, light and dark. That's going to give us the best starting point to extract this out. So let's look through. It looks like the blue channel is the best the, with the highest contrast. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that channel, we're going to slide it down here and duplicate it so there's a copy so we don't mess with the actual channel. And then we're going to pull up curves. We're going to grab this little guy here, the hand tool, and we're going to select just a, a lighter value on the element, on the uh, mountain here. We're going to pull it down till we get a pretty dark element. So you can see it's already creating contrast. Then we're going to swing it to the sky. And you can see the values in the sky where we can push that up and make that completely white. So now we have all this noise that we need to get rid of. We can't have this noise in our in our mat. So what I like to do is <clears throat> excuse me. I like to take my burn tool here and set it to let's set it to midtones and see what that does. Grab a brush and just go over it. And you can see, you know, it's starting to make those lighter little noises those pixels darker. Let's try yeah, shadows works a lot better. And you can choose, you know, where you which which values you want to hit, the shadows, the midtones, or the highlights. So you can see it's knocking all that stuff down and we don't need to go really we can be really free with this since it's not affecting, you know, the light values, it's only affecting the shadows. And really knock those down. And if you wanted to clean it up, we can take a nice brush, hard brush with no opacity, and really get in there and paint that stuff out too pretty quick. So now we have a really high contrast <clears throat> mat here. We can also, just to make sure <clears throat> that our sky values are completely white. We could take the dodge tool, set it on highlights. We can set our exposure. Maybe this is the strength, you know, something higher. And we can really go in there and make sure these edges are really white. You can see we had some value in there that we could have knocked down. And you can see what it does right there. Just knocks it out. We want to make sure that we're not really destroying the edges too much of our, our mountain a little rock piece here. So now we have our high contrast mat. So what do we do? We can we have to inverse this because we want to keep the white and get rid of the black. And once we hit, I hit the hotkey as control I for invert. Then I want to load this selection by control clicking it, you can see it selecting it. Then I come back into my RGB, I copy and I paste. So now we have a mat separated. Now to see what this really looks like without any distraction, I can fill this with black and you can see the mat that we have. We can also do, you know, if we didn't want the water, we can just go in there, the nice hard brush, and just clean out that water. Oh, it's not on the black layer. You know, just really, really clean it out like that. Now, say we wanted to, let's say this was against a lighter color. So we can really see the edges here. Let's say it's a sky. Fill the background out. Now what we see, let me make that darker so you can see this easier. It's my levels.
what we have here these edges we don't want these lighter edges they were the it's the one pixel edge from from the sky in the element so and you can see we have a little bit more we could have done a little better job with our cleanup if we go back to take a look at it we could have gone in here and done a little bit more of a use our burn tool just did a little bit more of a burn to really make sure we really clean up this element you can see now it's all disappeared and I'm just gonna grab delete that it's not from there so back to what we were talking about the white pixel around our edges we don't want that we want a nice clean element that looks natural we can see we have a little bit of noise clean up here that's not good either so how do we clean that up well one quick way to do that is going to layer matting defringe and what that's going to do is it's going to say select one pixel and remove it from the object so we can see before and after it's done a pretty good job of getting rid of some of those edges but there's still there's still some of that left some of that white edge left so how do we clean those up what I like to do is I like to hit the transparency on that layer and I'm gonna grab my clone brush my clone tool here pick a section that's close by to that area and just go over it now we're making sure we have the right value now depending on how close this element is in your painting we can get away with you know being a little bit more um, more free with this instead of being super accurate but you know in these areas click that by accident let me go back to my clone brush in these bottom areas here we can grab from up top and fill them in similarly with this we can fill those in you can see get rid of that white edge and when you're doing this you could be a lot more careful I am this is just a, a demonstration here but you can you guys get the point clicking off so that's one way of getting rid of it and cleaning up your element so now we can use this element it's ready for cleanup now you know hoping that we have we've done our our cleanup properly you know and gone in and fixed all this stuff um, so that we don't have any bad edges and that's the kind of detail you know attention to detail really cleaning up and making your mat nice and clean we don't want any um, even this noise here we can turn off our transparency and go in and with a nice hard brush as our eraser and go in and just clean these edges up so we don't have any floating noise we want this thing to be super clean for use and we have our element let's jump into another example so we got another mountain element so again looking through the channels making trying to figure out which one is the highest contrast between you know the lights and darks and the element we want to take out and our background the blue channel works here again we're going to go into our curves picking the lightest value on our element to pull down because if I pull that down you know everything else will be will be dark as well pull the sky up you can see there is no light everything is white as it could be in the background we can do it again we don't have to do it all in one we can go back again click our point here bring it down 
to really knock that down. And again, check our make sure our white values are all white. It is. So again, I'm going to go back to my burn tool here. We're going to burn the shadows just to make sure all the edges are nice and dark. There's no noise. Duplicate that. And we can do it for the sky as well now. Since we're burning the darks and the sky is dark now, we can use the same burn tool and make sure all our edges are nice, clean. Control select, copy and paste. And let's fill a background so we can see what we got. And again, if we don't want the bottom, we can delete it. Get an eraser here, just with a hard brush. With a shift tool holding shift down, we can just make create a nice hard edge. Now, if this was going into water, we would want to have that water in the element so that it's a nice seamless transition, but this is just for extraction. White edges. So let's go and clean that up. Let's take a look at everything else. Yeah. So again, we can go to layer matting defringe, one pixel. You can see it did a lot of the work for us seems to be clean and but there's still a little bit more cleanup to do can we set transparency on our layer we grab our clone tool here with a brush sample and just go over top here very quickly and I'll clean up a lot of that mess now you can see you got to be careful because you don't want to do you want to make sure I, I'm doing this fast so that's why but you don't want dark values on the edge there like that because if it's a lit edge you want to you want to sample a lit area and if it's a darker area you want to sample a darker area so we still got to be careful on the cleanup process let's go in here clean it up Quickly, but you can see we have all this nice edge detail um, instead of you know a lot of people using the lasso tool and you know this area if we wanted to go in there and you know make it even better we can create a clipping mask grab a brush with a little bit of, of tooth to it and go in and you know play around with this edges and create a little bit more of a edge variety that gives it a little bit more realism especially in these areas that's starting to flatten out so let's go back to our cleanup clean up quickly now if I was doing this for a, a map painting, I would take a little bit more time to clean that stuff a little better. But again, it depends on if this is really far back in the distance and it's you know it's hazed up, then we probably wouldn't need to go you know that far with this. We can probably get away. But you know, see that color uh, chromatic aberration? That stuff happens a lot when you pull um, when you pull uh, JPEGs from the internet. That's why it's good to always shoot your own reference because it's, if, especially if it's from a good camera, then you won't get a lot of this digital noise. But there you go. We have a nice clean element that we can use. All right, let's take a look at how to extract clouds. So with clouds, again, it's pretty much the same kind of technique trying to find the channel with the highest contrast this being the red you see this photo isn't the best quality and I picked it because of this and how we can clean up this noise in the channel as well so we duplicate the red channel again like we have I'm gonna go into my curves 
pick my points. Darkest point, pull down. I'm going to grab a light point on this. Pull it up. Now we want to pay attention to not to lose this nice edge detail. Because if I start hammering this and really pulling it down, you can see it can easily go south. We lose all that nice edge detail and it's just it just doesn't look realistic. So we want to make sure we preserve that while we're creating our mats. We can pull these points up manually as well. That'll be good for now. So again, we're going to go into our dodge and burn tools. This is the burn tool. Burn the shadows. Now with this, you typically want to go less strength and really work with the pen pressure to really just softly go in there. So we're not hammering. You know, I can go in there and do that and then we lose all that detail. We don't want to do that. We want to go in there softly with a nice soft stroke. You can see it went a little too far. So what we can do, if it's hurting it too much, what we can do is go into dodge tool, dodge the highlights, keep this on very low strength, and just softly just brush that in to give a little bit more brightness to those to those edges. That's gonna help it stand out against the black background when we're burning it. So you can see that it's bringing a little bit more of that in edge information back as we start dodging. And then we can go back into our burn tool. Just softly, softly go on the edges. We're not gonna keep this stuff. We can just take it out very softly, not to destroy any of that nice edge detail. We don't need that. Switch back to our dodge, and I just use the Shift O, which is a hotkey to sh to switch from from our burn to dodge. Go into our midtones now, because these are in the midtones. I'm going to start dodging the midtones. Now that we have our background as dark as possible, this midtone is not going to affect that shadowed area. We're just affecting the midtone values. Now, if I were to do this with a brush, it's going to it's going to go over the edges. It's going to kill a lot of this nice edge detail. It's just not going to look as good. And this is just a more controlled way of creating mats instead of just taking a soft brush and going all over the place and killing our edge detail. You can see we got a little bit more noise down there. So I'm going to go back to my burn tool. Just softly bring that down. and we have our cloud. Control select. Now I created, to see this, I created a nice kind of blue background here so we can really see it. Oops, not that selection. Still in my clipboard. Copy, paste, and you can see we have a nice matted out cloud. Now again, the same thing happens you know, to clouds as well and we do the transparency and we can use our clone brush here to clone those pixels and get rid of that chromatic aberration you can see it's adding a little bit more of that detail to the edges and these are these seem to be pretty good yeah this is where it's hurting so we can just sample that
and clone it out. Again, I would be paying a little bit more attention to the um, how I'm cloning this, but for this demonstration, I just want to show you guys how you can do it. And you can move this around. You can scale it, move it, and create our own skies. And you have all this nice edge detail that gives it the realism of a real cloud you know you don't have a lot a lot of times I see um, you know beginner map painters do uh, stuff like this where it's you know the element they've, they've extracted looks like this and it it's just you know it's awful and it doesn't look real and you know look at the realism we have that a nice edge detail there so that's what we're aiming for the nice high quality high quality map so let's do another one another sky another cloud here with a little bit more detail so this is going to be a little bit more tricky to extract but we're going to go with the same process highest contrast channel being the red Duplicate it. Go to my curves. Pick my point. Pull it down. Now we want to be careful we're not destroying it again. Killing the detail. So we're going to go back and forth with this one until, until we get something nice. So you can see the bottom is, is lit a little too much. Pulling it down, but paying attention to not to kill a lot of the nice detail here. And you can see our curve starting to get wonky. That just means that, you know, this point is lighter than this, so we can actually get rid of this point and still retain. We're going to have to pull this back a little bit because it was going a little too far since we got rid of that point. To bring that edge detail back. Always making sure to keep the detail in there. We don't want to kill anything off. Yeah, I'm just going to back off this a little bit. So you can see not the way to preserve this detail is using the the dodge and burn tools. So you know create a little bit more contrast between the light and the dark so that we can mat it out a little better. So what we want to do first is dodge the highlights Again, keeping it very low strength and go in here softly with the pen pressure on. I'm just, you know, I'm just grazing it. I don't want to, you know, I'm not hammering it like that because we're going to get a lot of the stuff that we don't want of the background. And I'm just going over the edge just to add a little bit more of the opacity a lighter value to it so that we can extract it a little bit better and we're just focusing on areas that have you know closer values this area we're gonna get get away with a lot a lot better than you know areas like this where the values are getting a little closer so go back to my dodge tool just very lightly going over very lightly this is where sensibility really comes in. We don't want to hammer it. We want to make sure we retain all that beautiful detail in, in the reference. So once we've gone over a pass at that, we're going to go to our burn tool. Let's make sure it's set on shadows. And just lightly, very lightly, maybe bring down the strength a little bit and I like to keep my you know brush big so that it gives me nice fluid motions of the of the brush stroke always making sure to retain the detail being very, very careful. So 
So once we have a pass of the dodge, we brought down the the value difference between the lights and dark. So we can go back into our curves. And start pushing, pushing those values again. So the darks, bringing it down, making sure I'm not losing any of the detail. And our brights we can bring back up. Turn it off and on. We lost a little bit. So maybe we don't want to do that. We want to do a little bit more dodging and burning. Using my dodge tool. And doing the highlights to bring a little bit more of a value difference to those edges so that when we do use our curve, it's not going to obliterate it. Back to our burn. Very light brush strokes here. Very softly. Now we can decide, you know, this area is, is too noisy for that cloud, so we can just get rid of it. We don't want that information. Go in here, just softly. Nice fluid brush strokes here. Go back to our dodge. We can now dodge the midtones, turn up the turn up our strength here. We still want to make sure, you know, we're not killing, we're not going too f too much into the values. You can see, you know, we're starting to get a little bit noisy in there. Now, this is this is where you know shooting your own reference also helps um, instead of pulling from the internet because you don't know what kind of camera they use and you know compression it gives you a lot of digital noise. Whereas if I shot my own for these, I would have a lot of detail in it back to my burn tool come back in here just softly and again if I was doing this I would spend a little bit more time making sure this was just perfect but for this demo and you guys not falling asleep on me I'm gonna try to do this quickly as possible Select the channel, load the selection, copy. I'm going to bring it back into this, paste, Let's turn that off, and we have a nice, so you can see the whole thing here. Transform it down. We have a beautiful cloud here that we can go in and color correct or just keep as is, but we have all this nice, beautiful edge detail, and we can move it around. And if we wanted to, if there was a lot of cleanup, this doesn't look like much cleanup on this because we did a good job with the edges. No chromatic aberration. We have a beautiful, nice cloud element. All right, so let's do uh, a ship now and mat this out. Again, the same process, picking a high contrast channel, pulling down our darks, pulling up our whites to create that high contrast. Now this is going to take a little bit more cleanup because there's a little more detail and um, that's why I picked it so you guys can see how a little bit more complex element gets uh, extracted. But using the same techniques of the dodge and burn, burning in some of those shadow layers, uh, sorry, shadow elements, 
the rope is going to be a little tricky on this one because it's uh, such a light value and it's just one pixel. So using the dodge tool, to clean up some of those other lighter values that we don't want. Pick our curves again, make sure our white point is absolutely white so we get no artifacting. Trying to burn in some of those uh, the ropes there. And you'll see a different, uh, different technique to get those in as well in this one by uh, using another channel. So just burning in as much as we can to retain as much detail. And you can see me here doing it. I duplicated the channel again. And this time I'm going to focus just on separating out the rope. So making the rope as dark as possible and the sky as light as possible. I'm not worried about anything else. So adjusting it, adjusting it, and we got a good value. So I'm going to load that selection in and then paint into my first channel that I had with a black color so that it adds, you see how much more it's adding. But it also picks up sometimes some of the lighter value, and that's when you're going to have a little bit more cleanup to do. But uh, it's working a lot better. So I basically created one channel for the rope, and then the first channel we created was for the rest. So that's how you can combine uh, channels as well. You can focus on matting out one thing at a time, load the selection, and then come into your master channel and paint it in. So we're going in again using the dodge tool to dodge out some of those lighter values we don't want, making sure that we're not erasing too much of the rope out. And it's just uh, the nature of this element is there will be some, um, some, some of the rope there uh, kind of destroyed, but I'll show you kind of how I how I would go back and do a hand painting technique and to bring those back in. So here I was done with it. I load the selection, copy and paste, so that it's on a separate layer. Fill the layer underneath it with a nice color that I can I can see. Take a nice hard brush and clean it up. I decided to use a lasso tool to be a little sharper and more accurate. Let's take out the rest of this and I sped this up quite a lot so you guys don't get bored watching me do this but it's using the same techniques just a little bit more um, attention to detail on this one because of the uh, of the rope and all the elements uh, in this So painting that out painting it out and in areas where it's difficult to paint out I'll just knock it all out and then I'll go back and I'll paint it by hand I'll bring those the, the little rope there back in as you'll see in a minute. So I created a new layer, clipped it on top of the ship, and I sampled a color off of the plate, and I'm just painting in the lighter values. Now the reason we got the lighter value on the, on the rope is because of the light wrap that was in the photo. So the you know there's a one pixel rope there, and it's it's being affected by the the brightness of the sky behind it in the photo. So it comes through when you try to mat it out. And this is the way you clean up uh, you know something like this that's very thin in one pixel usually takes a lot of hand painted cleanup so again just sampling a color and going over top and covering up as much as we can anything that has a light value gets painted over and usually you know I'll take more time and more care if this was something in the foreground you know everything wouldn't be one value I would take time to make sure you know the, uh, the different materials if it was something in a foreground you'd be able to tell if it was a metallic material or if it was wood or it was a you know a rope uh, and you know have different colors for everything but um, for this demonstration it's it's a quick uh, fix for this one just sampling a color and and just painting right over top of the lighter values and the reason I didn't use the defringe on this one to get rid of that one pixel um, light uh, value that's around our element is because that rope is uh, technically one pixel. And when you run a defringe on it, it messes it up completely. So we can't use the defringe on this one. Usually when you have a very um, thin one pixel or you know two pixel, uh, element that needs to be defringed, it's usually better to do it by hand than, than to use the defringing tool. 
So keeping going. And you can notice that some of the rope has disappeared and it's become lighter. And we'll go in and paint those in by hand, bring it back in to bring that detail. As you see right there, it's just not, it uh, doesn't have enough opacity on it to hold up. So we'll have to go and paint that in separately. And I do this on a separate layer because I like to be able to control it. You know, if it's not working in some areas, I can erase it without affecting the the element that we that we took time to separate. You know, we want to work non-destructive. So just keep painting over it. And this is where I use the line tool. And again, with the same color that I had selected that I was painting with, I'm painting back in some of those areas where the rope was either you know disappearing or just didn't have enough opacity or just didn't have enough pixels and while we matted it out I'm just painting it back in quickly so, so we can get that detail back you see I'm taking care to make sure that if it, it follows the line of the actual element and not just making up um, the flow of the rope painting that back in Fix sampling that to fix the light edges on that. And yeah, if I was doing this uh, for a matte painting shot, I would probably take a little bit more care in in um, how I'm cleaning this up and and color. But for this demonstration, I think it shows the purpose of it. And I think we're almost done. We're just going to do some last minute cleanup here, and uh, we should be good to go with this element to use. All right, now let's talk about color correction. For that, I'm going to pull up this image that we used before so we can take a look at how we can color correct. My favorite color correction tool is Curves. The reason I like it is because you can create multiple points on this curve and correct specific areas of the image all along this curve. Now, you can't do that with levels, so that's what makes Curves uh, so powerful and you can get rid of the, the points like you see me doing there So let's take a look at what curves actually is. So we have our black point down here. We have our shadows our midtones Highlights and white point. So that's what generally this curve represents Get rid of those points So by moving the white point To the left here what we're doing is you're brightening up all the highlights and midtones in the image plus heightening contrast and saturation. So you can see by moving that, what we're doing is blowing out the whites. It also causes the saturation to heighten and raises the midtones as well because you see the midtone point has moved higher now. So the opposite effect here, if we move the black point to the right, you darken the tones throughout the picture. Everything to the left of this point here will be completely black. So if we move it, you can see our shadow areas turning slowly to black and it's also darkening the overall image because our midpoints, our midpoint here is, is lower on the curve and saturation has been increased. So what if we wanted to, to decontrast this image? So if we wanted to make this a little less contrasty, what we, what we can do is pull up the black points and if you move the black point straight up and the white point down like this, it will reduce the contrast and the saturation makes the image grayer and duller as you can see. So we pull this higher, you can see the blacks getting lighter, and we pull the whites down, you can see really we've killed a lot of the saturation from the image and the contrast as well. You can see a lot grayer and duller saturation and contrast way down. So to increase the contrast, what we can do is we move the black and white point. Oh, sorry, preview turned off there. We can move the black and white point in and that will give us more of a contrasty image. As you can see the difference there, a lot more contrast. But what that does is 
something we're going to talk about is called clipping the values. All right, so what is value clipping? Let's open up our curves again. So whenever you raise the black and white point, you throw away part of the image and cause sections to turn completely white or black. So you see in the sky and shadows, these areas have gone complete white, some shadow areas to complete black. So we've thrown away the information that was there previously and replaced it with white and black. So this usually happens when you download images from the web to use in your paintings. The, the images are compressed um, and often lose a lot of information to keep the file size down for the web. So that's why I try to shoot a lot of my own photos as much as I can because I can retain all the color information and keep the image at a really high resolution. So if we take a look, if we do this adjustment, and let's make an extreme case of it, you can see the histogram and you can find the histogram in window histogram to see what's actually happening in your image has shifted so what it did is it cut out all the values in the, in the whitest whites and the darkest darks and it's spread so the information has been thrown away and it's replaced by white at the location of the white point and black at the location of the black point now the remaining information is spread across the histogram so if you check it out and it, and it's no longer solid but has small breaks in the graph now I didn't go extreme to have breaks in the graph but um, the you know the what the breaks represent if I had pushed it is the tonal values from the middle of the graph have been spread over a larger area so it, it no longer has enough information to fill the gaps so if I undo this go back to my curves so if you think of this as um, if I have a hunk of jam on my toast and spread it the entire toast would have a pl would have plenty of jam for me to enjoy um, spread evenly and delicious now if I was to scrape off a big chunk of the jam and then try to spread the remaining little little amount that's left over the toast this time the toast won't would be you know the jam on the toast would be thin and wouldn't spread evenly on the toast it's just not going to taste that good. So the same thing with our images. Because you have fewer steps for fine gradations, smooth transitions in the image um, become a little harsh and crunchy. So same thing goes here. We're clipping the value. It means no more information above uh, that value is, is retained. Okay, And what then happens is the midtones get spread across and we lose a lot of this. So that's clipping the values right there. We've clipped it. There's no longer any information in the whitest white and the darkest darks. And that is not a good thing. It causes your images to look crunchy. I see a lot of, you know, new map painters doing this. We typically try to stay away from this as much as possible. Um, you know, if you, if you take a look with, you know, if you really go outside and take a look at something, there's always information. There's never black or white, you know. Even in the far distance with fog, you can see very minute details and change of value. So this is something we typically try to stay away from as much as possible. So the better way to color correct is by raising the mid the midtones. So the better option is to lighten your image without losing information by raise the midtones right here. If we grab this. You do this by moving the middle point of the curve and it lightens the image without uh, the excess um, contrast or saturation. And the same goes for darkening the image by moving the point down. So we're still retaining information, but we're darkening it down slightly. That's the better way to grade your image. All right, so let's undo that. Go back to our curves here. And let's take a look at the channels, because curves can also affect channels, which makes it another very powerful tool here. So that was grading. We talked about value and grading contrast. Now we can actually go into color here. So we go into the red channel up here. 
So by moving the red channel down in the midtones, okay, you darken the image and remove the red from the midtones, and it's and you, what you do is you add its opposite, blue green. So you can see, so I remove it, it's turning bluer and greener. So the opposite happens if I increase the midpoint here. What you do is you lighten the image value and add more red to the midtones. So you've added more red to the midtones, and we're removing red and adding more of a blue green, and also darkening the image when we pull it down. The opposite, we lighten it. So we take a look at the, the blue channel. So when you pull down the blue channel, you remove the blue and add its RGB opposite color yellow. So you can see as we pull it down, extreme case turning into a yellowy green. And the opposite here, when we pull it up, we're adding blue to the midtones there, magenta. And the last channel here, when you pull down, the green channel, you, you remove green and add its RGB opposite, magenta red. So again, we remove the magenta red. And when you go up on the curve, you're adding more green to its to the midtones there. So the major advantage of curves over levels is that we can create a curve in our color correction with the ability to adjust the channels at both the light and dark ranges simultaneously along with the curve for more control so you know I can go in here darken down the image and then go into my blue channel and say you know I really want this to look really warm and green well let's take out some of the blue in the midtone ranges I can also take my picker here where do I want to remove the blues let's say you know you can see where the value is on our graph on our curve I want to pick right there and I'm just going to move it down. You can use the arrows or just with your mouse here, pull it down. So you can see we've made it warmer by removing the cool colors and we've darkened the value down with our RGB and the blue. So take it out, look how cool it looks there. And if we pull it out, the of the shadow values it becomes a lot warmer now what if we also wanted to make the greens a lot greener so we can go and see where these values are that we want to affect it's about right there so I set my point there and I increase the green but I don't want the greens to appear in the shadow area so we put a point there and I can knock down in the shadow areas maybe I want to affect just the light areas here. You can see the water, which is the lightest area here, getting affected. And you can see what our color correction has done so far. And that's what it's doing. If I take away the shadow areas, it's now brightening up all the greens in the lighter, lighter uh, part of the curve. I can pull that back down. We don't want to affect that area. So that's how powerful curves is, that we can affect different sections of this um, of the image, the element that we want to use, to get the exact look that we want. So if we redo all our color correction and say now I want this to be a lot cooler, so I can pull out some of the warmth from the midtones. Add some blues. I'll oh, sorry, pulled it out there. And now our image starts to look a lot, a lot cooler. See how warm it was, and we knocked out, we took out all the the red values in the mid range. So it's a very powerful tool. It comes with experience just kind of playing around with it. Uh, I like to use the picker here to show me where that point is on the graph. 
so that if I want to affect this area, I put a point there and I can push and pull just that one area. You can see how it's affecting it. So that's very powerful. Now, the other thing that we can do is if we take this off and say I want to grade this down and then I want to use hue and saturation. The hotkey I use is um, control U to pull that up. Now say we wanted to really bump up the greens here in, um, in the vegetation on this mountain. We can go into our human saturation under master. We want to affect only the greens. If we can push this, you can see what it's, how it's really affecting um, the colors here. Now we can also expand this so that the green would apply to a whole wider range. I can cut this down or expand it on this curve to affect a wider range of greens. If I push it to a warmer, you can see it dying down the color correction because we're getting out of the range of the color that we're trying to affect. So that right there is another way I can affect it. If I wanted to you know, push this and make it any other color as well, I can take it. Now this is an extreme example, but um, I can really push it to a different value. You can see the color correction there. So that's another way we can affect. Um, if we reset this, cancel that, pull it up again. Say I want to create, you know, a little cooler effect and really make it really nice and, and cool. I can push this, the cyan values around. I can affect its brightness. I change the light and it's affecting the range that I've set in this bar. So I can make it, I can expand it and it'll affect a lot more. Can really push it to get exactly what I want to do. So those two tools I use a lot, hue and saturation and curves to really push my my color correction. Um, as we get into more uh, map and examples, you'll see this how it really uh, comes into effect and how powerful it can be. Okay, the last thing I want to show you guys is how to manipulate photos using the transform tools. So here's an image I shot and I want to separate out I separated out um, the bark here and I wanna you know transform it warp it and get it into my concept image well here's some you know just by clicking control T to create the transform I right click and it gives me the options to transform now there's scale obviously as you guys I'm sure are familiar with we have rotate Pretty simple. A skew, you know, moving up and down. This is better for buildings, as I'll show you in a minute. But the one thing I do like is one of my favorites is distort. The distort tool allows me to move things in perspective. So I can move it back away. I can move these points closer. So I can really move things in perspective, or I can have it, you know lie down flat by just grabbing the points you can see if it's too too crazy it'll, it'll freak out but you can fix that you can see how powerful this this um, transform tool is that you can really push things to its absolute limits here and make it look you know completely different so that's one of my favorites there's also the perspective tool which just move things, you know, in perspective along the points, you know, uh, together. So you distort, you can move all those points out separately, but these, they move together. And lastly, the warp tool, which allows you to distort kind of like a lattice, if you do 3D, into different areas here if I want to move along and warp it along a curve 
I can, you know, really push and pull this to have it really curve down. It's good for round objects when you're trying to put a photo on either, you know, a cylinder or something of that shape. Uh, this tool is great for that. Another tool that I like to use is called the Puppet Tool, called Puppet Warp. And what this does is creates a lattice here around your, um, your separated out element. But what it also allows you to do is create little anchor points, almost like pivot points or joints that it will rotate around. Like if I pull this, you can see everything will stay the same, only this area will move. So a really, really powerful tool to create really stylized shapes and designs, or if you want to wrap something around uh, a, um, a weird form that's kind of loopy like this or you know uh, that this is the perfect tool for it and you just click enter when you're done and you have a warped image and you can see there isn't much distortion in the texture it you know there is a little bit here but you can see how far we can take it and it will still retain a lot of the information so that's another great tool that I like to use and if we were to take a look at, you know, um, a little cityscape here, if I want to change, you know, the perspective of this building, I can select that face. And with my transform tool, you know, I can distort it into, oops, I can distort it back into perspective according to my perspective grid, let's say for my, for if I was working on a concept and the perspective was a little different, well, I can pull this reference image up and then select the faces, and then using my perspective grid, I can really push this to match um, my painting. You can see how powerful the store tool is. And similarly, the same thing to these faces. Might be a little tricky because there's multiple of them, but we can do it individually or we can do it, you know, all together and really, really push the perspective of this. So that's using the Store tool, and we can also use the Skew tool for this as well. If we select this face again, and we go Skew, we can you know move it along uh, our perspective points in our painting as well. So that's really handy. And we'll get into this when we do um, in a later week when we do a cityscape map painting I'll really show you how guys how to uh, use photos uh, to match your paintings and uh, your perspective your own perspective grids so that is the gist of the transformation tools and uh, manipulation again we'll, we'll be seeing these a lot more and uh, once you see them uh, you know during the demos that I'll be doing you will really get a sense of how to use them and what they're useful for um, I just wanted to give you guys a general gist of it so that you're familiar with it if you ever see it coming up. Um, so uh, after this, we're going to get into a little demo. I'm going to do a little quick map painting for you using a lot of the uh, techniques that we learned uh, today. Uh, let's get started. All right, so let's get started with our demo. And I sped this up quite a bit because this is about uh, two and a half, almost three hour painting. So I didn't want you guys to, to watch me do it for that long. But... I started out with a value sketch just to block in everything that I wanted and I have a couple of reference photos up there to help me along the way. I grabbed this beach element. This is something I shot uh, down in Laguna Beach to start with uh, the beach. You can see I used the transform tools and I've, driven, I've drawn out the horizon line there so I got to match the horizon line of my image. I use my hue and saturation at the top always to see the values and start to color correct the beach down a little get into the values uh, that I need it to be and I'll do my color corrections all on a separate layer so I can do one for you know the the value and then I'll have another one another curve adjustment layer clipped on for the color and you'll see that come uh, come along the way as this gets further along 
using the warp tool here there was a little bit of distortion in the in the image and I just want to make sure that everything is straight in the plate and matches the horizon line perfectly so that's where we use the the warp tool as well for subtle adjustments like that I wouldn't be able to move specific parts of that image using the other transform tools and this is a sky that I had stitched together with several different photos uh, previously that I want to reuse just to save some time so you use a soft brush on a clipping mask again I like to create clipping masks for everything I do so it's non-destructive I could go back and forth and I noticed that the value of that is a little too too dark and looking at the reference you see how bright the sky is so I'm gonna have to lift it up a little bit the contrast in the reference photo that we see up there is very very subtle between the lights and dark so that's something um, I want to take note of just color correcting it with a color balance take it out of the the cool range and maybe into a little bit more of a bluer magenta look we'll see how it progresses but now color correcting the sand down a little and you can see all of those on a separate separate um, layer all my color correction so I can go in and adjust them manually um, whenever I want without destroying the element that's underneath let's darken down a little bit more got rid of two color cracks and just decided to stay with the one I had and bumping up the reds in the sand while maybe taking down a little of the blue that's in there just to warm it up just a little bit Maybe the contrast a little too high fixing that sky again painting in this is why clipping masks are very helpful because I can paint in and paint out anytime I want without destroying the element it's starting to work in there for us just gonna save it always save your work I don't know how many times it's crashed on me and I've lost hours of work but now I'm doing a, a global kind of color correct that will serve as a kind of a, a, a direction for every other element that I bring in uh, into this painting. You see I'm doing a little cleanup with the renaming and now we're starting to look for elements to bring in. Again, I notice that there's a sign in there so I'm just going to clone that out before I make my mat and I look for the highest contrast like we, sh we did earlier and just using the the picker tools there to, to, to select the the brightest value and the darkest value and just dodging and burning again to clean it up some manual cleanup here just to make sure the edges are all nice and tight and now inverted our select in our mat make sure it's all clean copy and paste and paste it into our uh, painting here scaling it down we're gonna have to paint those guys down out sorry and I do that again with a clipping mask I set transparency on my layer again like we have been doing and cleaning up the edges making sure there's no chromatic aberration or just uh, a white pixel edge around our stuff making sure all our elements are clean And make sure your transparency is on and again I'm referring to my sketch on where that element was I may uh, readjust it um, but at least the sketch gives me a, a nice starting point taking out the blue that was in that sand from the, the fill light of the sky that was in the, the photo reference and just grading it I like to keep on that hue and saturation uh, on so I can see the value. Uh, I'm not affected by the color. I'm just concentrating on values and then I'll turn it uh, back off and correct the, the color. I'm doing a little more cleanup on that element using a hard brush so we don't have any artifacts left over. Using the skew tool to skew it down a little bit. And let's find an element for our foreground piece again high contrast mat we're making sure that we get all of it with a dodge and burn 
same stuff. You guys are are probably getting bored of it now, but uh, yeah, it works every time. So we paste it in. This is going to take a lot of um, kind of photo manipulation to get this thing working like we had it in our sketch there. But you'll see transforming it, scaling it. Uh, I'm going to paint it out so it's a little easier to see how it's going to fit in. Again, with a clipping mask. And trying to follow a natural line on that rock. Now I could go back and forth and I'll clean up it again. But uh, when you first try to clean out an element, make sure if it's, uh, it's following the form of the rock. Using the distort tool to start distorting in perspective. Now I'm using the warp tool to straighten this out with different points. And you can see how easily that the element that was uh, looking uh, up now could uh, work in our purpose here. I'm going to bring that down so it fits into our crop. Fixing it again with the warp, making sure it's straight. I want it to be flat. I don't want it to feel round. I want it to feel like a straight kind of rock coming out of the sand there, straight up. I'm going to turn on transparency, maybe do a little cleanup first. Clean up that chromatic aberration and that light edge on the side. Place it back to where we want it to be. Going back to our sketch to find the placement. Playing again with some transform, manip uh, manipulating this photo to what we need it to be. You can see how powerful those transform tools can be about taking that photo that uh, didn't look like it could have worked in our painting, but uh, you know, transforming it back to something that we can use. Making sure that when we paint out on our element that we're following the flow of the rock. We're not making random cuts in the rock that it's it's following the natural cur the cuts and crevices of that rock again using the the warp tool to make sure that this is straight and working for us turning it on and off and comparing it with our sketch always going back to our sketch I'm going to use the clone tool to to fill in that missing area, just sampling off the rock and cloning right back into it. So we want to adjust the sky now. I want some of those perspective lines in the in the clouds to come a little bit more into the picture to draw your eye in. So I push that forward because that the rock is blocking it. We can get away with it. And now adding a little bit of fog to 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 add a little atmosphere to this. And I sample the color off of the sky and it's on a separate layer with a soft brush just going and painting in and painting out making sure that we have the right amount of haze again we're looking at a reference to see how much haze do we want how much detail do we want to see in that rock and then um, and then painting it in so right now I'm doing I just did a global color correct to see maybe what it will look like if I was to bring this down and what I did there to, to simulate the shadow of that rock, I put a separate curve on top of my stack and curved it down from the light point down and then the midtones down. And then I inverted it so it was black and now I'm painting in with a white soft brush to simulate a kind of a shadow or ambient occlusion shadow um, falling across, that, uh, across the sand from that rock. And cooling it down a little bit just so there's a little more fill light contribution because it's in shadows and now looking for another element that we can use you can see how collecting a lot of reference is useful when you're doing a painting because I could choose from a whole bunch again doing the same thing high contrast matte making sure we're using the dodge and burn tools to to knock out all that noise and, uh, and retain the edge detail that we need and take out what we don't using a hard brush to get in some of those harder places to mat out make sure our element is clean invert the selection load it and this time I use the lasso tool because I don't want the entire element. I just want a piece of it. And we're going to paste it right into our painting. Scale it down to where we want it to be. Turn off the fog so I can do a little bit of cleanup. 
And when you're doing this cleanup, you can see in the 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 clone tools um, sample uh, pull down menu that says current layer. You want to make sure that you're only sampling the current layer, because if it was on all layers, then you'd be sampling all color corrects and you know curve adjustments that were placed um, above it, and it just won't match. So make sure that's on current layer when you're doing that. So now I'm painting out what I don't need. I don't want maybe some hand painted again trying to follow the the flow of that rock and not just doing arbitrary paint out we're gonna this is gonna serve as a base for the a taller spire rock there now I'll paint out the bottom I can be I can afford to be a little loose with this because it's so foggy that um, a lot of this is going to get pushed back and we're not going to see a lot of that detail so I can be a little bit more um, free-handed with this than I usually am than being super precise but I think for this exercise and demonstration this, this will serve just wanted to show you guys how you can uh, use all the the techniques we learned today and apply it to a map painting get something pretty quick So I added a clipping mask at the bottom and I just painted out a little bit of the bottom so that, you know, there's a seamless transition and it looks like it's going back in the fog in the distance and adding a little bit more fog on top of the element on the fog layer to push it further back, hazing out the bottom of that element. I want this thing to get lost in fog, so I'm just going gonna, gonna to blast it with some, some value there. And again, just sampling off the sky. Um around there and with a soft brush doing it on a separate layer now what I did here is create a clipping mask and clipped it on top of uh, our rock element and what I want to do is add a little bit of light wrap as light comes streaming from that side it's gonna go uh, it's gonna wrap around the edge of that foreground rock and what it does is just softens that edge a little bit so it's not such a razor cut kind of cut out a look it's more of a natural lighting type of scenario as you and you could take a look at reference and see where you know the sharper edges are and the softer edges are and this is what we're doing right now we're just putting a, adding a little bit of light wrap and uh, just taking the edge off that uh, the sharp edge off that rock just finessing it, erasing back into it, making sure it's right. A little bit more cleanup on the edge of the rock, making sure we have a nice, nice clean mat there. Just gonna grade it down a little. All right, so we've jumped ahead a little bit, um, just so you guys don't get super bored with me watching, doing it. I'm kind of doing the same thing um, that I've been doing with the other stuff to get this uh, rock um, placed in there. And all that was, is you can see, so this is what we had. And what I did was I pretty much took the same, same element here that we used for the bottom part and I placed it on top of here so what it was and I rotated it around so we get the sharper I like this top edge here so I rotated around and masked it in to a shape that that I wanted that matched our sketch and then I stretched and squashed it so I can make it a little bit more um, more of a vertical structure and just painted in where I wanted this rock as you can see the bottom is right there so the next thing I did was I wanted the, a light face to kind of get hit on this side because that's where, you know, our light, we're saying that maybe there's a light, uh, there's a hole in the a gap in the clouds back here and there's some light streaming in. So we want, you know, a, a side uh, face here to catch that light. And what I did with that is I like the, um, this element here. You see it's reflecting the sky. That's why it's so blue. It's wet. So it's reflecting the, the blue sky up top. 
but I said I can use that element in there. And I grabbed that part, brought it into my image here. And that's this part right here. You can see. Masked it in so I can so I have only so I keep only this side face. Let me turn that adjustment off. You can see that blue. And I masked in the area that I wanted. And then since you know the color of the light is not this blue this is this should be reflecting the sky I have to just adjust that color with um, with the hue and saturation I went into my blues and I knocked down the saturation completely so you know it was up here I knocked it down and then I turned up the brightness on it so that it's super bright not super bright but bright enough and we and I painted in just the areas that I wanted it to affect. So you can see that's the mask, just that area to, to, to take out that blue and reflect some of that some of that light coming in from the other side. Now I could also oh this is kind of messed up. I'll copy over the the uh, the mask on this on the curves adjustment layer and I could turn it up to make it even brighter. And I'm going to just warm it up just a tiny bit, not too much. And then hit it with a tiny bit there. Turn down the opacity so it's not as powerful. And you can see just made it a little bit brighter to simulate kind of some light maybe trickling through here and hitting it. Um, I may not like it, I may not keep it, but we'll see. But I'll keep it on for now. You can see this element has a lot more cleanup to do. So I'm going to jump on that. And you can see the edges need a lot more work to make this uh, a little bit more believable. But uh, I like where this is going. It's sitting in there well. So let's get to cleaning it up and then adding some few more details, maybe some reflection here on the ground, some a little bit more interest in this area so it's not so plain. And uh, let's start to finish this thing up. All right, so we're back up to a little bit more sped up process. And this is cleaning the element like we have been, getting rid of that edge. Just painting it out. Making sure it's all clean. And there's a lot more cleanup to do on this element. can see making sure that those edges are clean and they follow the flow of that rock it's very important to keep a natural feel to it it doesn't look like you just you know cut it out with some scissors and pasted it in now that bottom area we might be able to get away with a little bit more because it's really hazed out but uh, I'm still gonna go in there and clean it up Clean up that element in the way it transitions into the other rock, making sure that the f the form um, is correct. You know that's that's one side face and the other side is it's side plane. So make sure everything reads properly. Just going back and working into the silhouette. Now adding a little bit more fog to knock this element back. I don't want it to be a close element. And using um, a cloud brush that I have in my set just to add a little bit more texture to it. Now later on in other demos I'm going to show you how you can use masked out clouds as, uh, as fog but in this uh, demonstration I just use a cloud brush because we don't have to be too precise with this one. It's just a demonstration of different uh, color correction and extraction techniques. Actually, I think at the end of this painting, I actually am not happy with the, the look of that uh, mountain and I end up swapping it out, but we'll get to that part later. Looking through our reference to try to find another piece uh, that could help us out, make our painting a little bit more interesting. 
And I liked the top edge of that, and I'm wondering if I can use it for uh, that uh, vertical spire rock on the top to create a little bit more of an interesting uh, rock formation and shape. So I'm just selecting that top part, copy and paste it over, see if we can add a little bit more interest to that area. Again, I mentioned that it gets completely replaced, so what you're seeing is probably not going to end up in the final, but... It's good to see how you can mix and match different photos to get a whole different uh, look to to something and how you can mix and match it. Now, it's uh, helpful that when I do mix and match that um, I'm looking for rocks that are in the same family and the same look, so it makes my integration a lot easier. It's not uh, two completely different types of rock. And I'm um, just doing a little color correction here to try to match it to what's underneath a little bit. I'm just painting out the the rock that was underneath it. So it gives us a little interesting look. Yeah, and so I realize I think later that I don't like it and I, I replace it. But it's worth a try to see if we can get something interesting and if it doesn't work we can always replace it with something else as you'll see a little bit later in this demonstration just moving around making sure that it fits right and looks right and you see it needs to need a little bit of cleanup with the other element that we had there let's fix the edge there and this new element needs cleanup too so again we turn on our transparency on our layer just using a clone tool, sampling a little bit of that rock and just going over the edge to get rid of the chromatic aberration and uh, digital noise that was in the, the, the element. And you see, I like to also always work, you know, with my canvas zoomed out. So it really gets, it lets me see the entire canvas and how things are going together. If I was zoomed in there painting with a one pixel brush on that element, I could miss a lot of things and see like uh, different things that an element aren't even working together properly. So I like to work zoomed out like this. I felt like it needed a little bit more interest in that area. And I think when we jumped ahead, um, I forgot to mention that uh, I had painted a little bit of that sand coming up into the rock, into the crevices at the bottom there to help it integrate and sit a little better. And I took an element, uh, just like I'm doing now, and I put it in at the base of that rock. So it's not just one massive rock jutting up, but uh, there's a buildup of uh, rock formation up there. And I used the element that I just brought in. It had some nice uh, reflection of the fill light of the sky in it. So I, I wanted to integrate that type of detail into this rock. And here we're doing a little bit of cleanup, grouping things together and naming them. So it's a little e easier to find stuff in our in our scene, in our uh, layer stack. And looking at another element here, what I'm looking to get out of this is, I believe, the green, the grass on the top there, and see if we can use some of that in our in our rocks to add a little bit more color. We don't want this thing to look monochromatic. So that could bring some visual interest and some color into our element. Yeah, so it's the grass there. Copy and pasted it over. See if we can use this and paint it in. Color correct it, add a layer mask, and just with a with a textured brush with a you know a textured edge, I'm just painting it out so it's not uh, soft or super hard. Adjusting the values, the black levels on that the element were a little too too dark for the for what it was sitting on. Needs a little bit more cleanup. Making sure that it's sitting on faces and not just copy and paste it on top that it makes some sense. And on a separate layer, I sample that color from from the from the grass there and I turn on a little bit of scattering and some color dynamics to, to jitter the hue so that every time I paint the actual color is adjusting or you know it's varying within uh, uh, a, a range of color 
just to give it a little bit more realism and not uh, a flat color look. As you can see in that element, there's a lot of different colors in that just that simple grass. But again, this is going to be really far in the distance with some haze so we can get away with doing quick painting. And we can sample colors and make sure we're painting on the right faces. Let's add a little bit more color to this, a little bit more interest. Again, with that textured brush, just painting out so it has a little bit more of a, a broken edge. Erasing and putting and placing in our grass, our vegetation, moss maybe. It seemed looked a little too bright, so I'm just going to knock that, knock that value down. And putting a little bit more lighter specks in there because it's wet. We'll get a little bit, a little bit of reflection. And uh, usually, you know, I have that reference up uh, above. To look at but I've done this before that's why you don't see too many reference photos up but when I am doing a painting for a first time that I'm not used to I'll have tons and tons of reference up so we jumped ahead a little bit more and you can see on the left hand side there that I add a, a little bit more interest with uh, a little bit of reflection maybe some uh, some wet spots some more, more rocks there and it's again using the same process that we have been doing adjusting the value of that back rock there to sit in a distance a little bit more and what I'm doing here is I duplicated that layer to create a light side I added a clipping mask on top of it and made it high contrast so only the light faces stand out and I put it on screen mode and what that does is only it screens on just the light values that I have in that element and I create a clipping mask invert it and paint into the light areas that you can see me doing so that those faces facing the light source, which is off to the right now to the right side, um, it looks like it's being hit by maybe uh, a gap in the cloud somewhere and some light streaming through. So it's not so flat. It adds a little bit more form to to our element there. So that's essentially also how you relight an element. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more, but uh, I, I used it here. Just wanted to let you guys know how you do it. So doing the same thing, copying that layer over and putting a curve on top. And you see me really cranking the blacks because when I screen it on, those blacks won't show up. It will just be the light faces. You can see me painting in just the light. And I invert it and I paint it in and it's on a separate layer. And I put a color balance in to, to, to make it a little cooler that it's reflecting the sky. And it adds a little bit more form, a little bit more detail to it, and it just it's a lot better than having a flat element in there. And you can see whenever I'm painting a fog and I want to sample a color off the sky, I turn off that uh, adjustment layer on the top there that grades it all down and makes it contrastier so that uh, it's not doing a double adjustment. So on a separate layer here, I wanted to put something really far back in the distance just to add a little bit more uh, detail in the background maybe it's a really far distant uh, another vertical rock sticking up in this environment and we can get away with just using a flat color because it's so far and so much atmosphere is affecting it that there's going to be very little detail in it so naming everything to make sure everything's nice and tidy still not happy with the, the color correction on this and I think at the end eventually I'll get rid of it because the edges are just too harsh and the scale isn't really working at the moment and I'll, I'll get to that uh, near the end of uh, the demo. I'll realize it and I'll change it out. So here we're trying to we're trying to grab the rocks there with the moss on top of it just to add a little bit of color to this element and you see I did the same process and just selected the 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 moss uh, rock area and I'm just with a clipping mask and a textured brush I'm just painting out what I don't want and keeping the rocks you know maybe it's collecting down there just add a little bit more color and I'm gonna affect saturation was a little high so I pulled it down and I sampled the color on a separate layer and I used again my 
scattering tool in my brush and the color dynamics to, to jitter the, the color of uh, every brush stroke and I'm just painting in some of the surfaces now to add a little bit more color and it also add, helps with the form to see the forms a little better the top facing surface is getting them you race into it see now I'm also putting it in the reflection and you can see the fog just completely knocks it out but you know what it adds a little bit of something and you can see I have a global color correct at the top to create what ultimately my image will look like and I'll do this a lot is create a color correct that I you know I know my image might look like at the end and I'll keep it at the top of my layer stack and I'll turn it on and off see I zoomed out really far back to take a look at what's happening doing a little bit of cleanup and you see we jumped ahead again and added some reflection and that reflection was a little bit of painting hand painting and using a photo reference that uh, the beach had a reflection in it and I just copy and pasted that in and with a soft brush I just uh, painted in exactly where I needed to be and on a separate layer I put that highlight in I clipped it onto that layer and I put the highlight in to, to catch the uh, light part of that sky and what I'm doing now on the sand is for scale purposes we the details in the sand are just too big so I just grabbed a brush and on a separate layer um, just sampling the color around it and uh, just painting it out essentially so that uh, our scale doesn't uh, doesn't get hurt here we want this place to feel big and if you have um, big details like that it's gonna it's gonna hurt our scale so just painting it out against just sampling colors at some point I'll use uh, the clone tool but it's mostly the uh, just sampling color that's around it and just painting it painting it out and we can get away with it because the sand is fairly forgiving and I have my hue jitter on this brush too so it, I, that definitely helps and this is using essentially hand painting techniques to clean up an element and because this image is so it's really big right now I think it's it's almost it's 3,000 pixels we're gonna scale this down so we can afford to hand paint it because when you scale down all that detail just uh, starts mashing together and, and it looks a lot better so doing a reflection here I duplicated the 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 rock group there flattened it out and flipped it vertically put it underneath the fog I'm just gonna affect um, play around with some blend modes see if it works I'm not too happy with this so I'll just go with the opacity and I'm gonna use a blur motion blur and go straight down to add a little bit of a blurring effect I'm gonna create a clipping mask put that to black paint it in to where I want it to be in and then we're gonna knock it down in the opacity and then using uh, a scatter brush just a round brush scattered and um, squashed to create maybe uh, to paint out you can see a little bit more detail you know maybe some ripples and rock or some reflection that the, that the the reflection is not casting on and to break up that shadow a little bit and again usually I would be you know I'd be looking at reference like this and seeing how is that rock casting a shadow on that edge but um, for this demonstration I'm gonna be a little bit loose and I've done this scenario a couple of times so I know um, how to get it there to make it look uh, semi -re semi real I try to make it as real as possible so honing in that reflection I'm gonna save it we're almost there just turning it around and seeing what what could be fixed value checking our values and I noticed that we can add a little bit more of a bloom on that side to, sim to uh, simulate kind of maybe light streaming through a gap in the cloud somewhere and I use the the foreground rock 
as a mat there so the bloom doesn't affect the uh, the foreground rockets behind it so we put in characters and you can see these are characters I had matted before and I copy and pasted it in color corrected them and the same exact process like we have been doing with the other stuff I duplicated the reflection and um, flipped it vertically put a little motion blur you know fix the opacity to put the reflection in the in the in the water there and now just using some hand painting on a separate layer to uh, to really finalize these characters but the exact same process was used matting out the character I think I used more of a lasso tool because the the background of these characters weren't um, was in high contrast so I had to use more uh, of the lasso tool and I could be kind of uh, freehanded with this because it's, it's so small in the distance that I can get away with it but giving this guy a spear, a spear and um, now I'm just gonna fix the reflection it was a little too sloppy so I'm gonna add a little more occlusion reflection there and paint out uh, some stuff that I don't need add some color into the reflection to help it sit a little better Fix reflection again, add a little bit of color, and we should be good to go with these guys. Just add a little bounce light. We're not going to see any of this because it's so small, but uh, why not? Let's have fun with it. And again, this even this little detail we're probably not going to see, but why not? It's fun. Let's put it in. Maybe some kind of sp the, the horse is kicking up some splashing around there to create a little bit more ripple effect a little more splash so that picks up a little bit uh, a speck see it kicking up some water and that's all in separate layers so i can paint it out take it out if i want you can see we barely see it but hey it's fun to do and i think we're almost done with this the last thing we're going to do is i think uh i wasn't happy with the rocks so i'm going to replace that and just adding a little bit more of a low-lying fog with a cloud brush, some texture, just to separate out the characters from that back rock. I thought they were sitting in, they were blending in too much, just to create a little bit of separation, a little bit of fog. And you can see, yeah, I was tired of that rock, so it's time to replace it. And so pretty much doing the same thing, creating a high contrast, copy and paste. I'm going to scale this up. Now, usually I don't recommend scaling it up, but because this is so fogged up, and we're going to scale this image back down that we can get away with it a little bit. We don't want to do that too much because you start, um, it starts getting pixelated and, and soft. As you can see right now, it's getting soft. But the amount of haze that I'm going to put on top of this and um, the fact that we're going to scale this image down from 3K to something like a 1500 pixel um, image, we can get away with something like this. But I wouldn't recommend doing it for a final map painting. You always want to work with the high res highest resolution possible. Cleaning it up, fixing it with some transforms, some color correction. We're going to take down the contrast a little bit because it was too contrasty for the for how far back it is. So you know we lift the darks, we pull down the lights to decontrast, like I showed you guys earlier in this uh, in this week's class. And then doing the same light layer, we want to create some form. So I duplicated it, put it on screen mode, and I put um, a curve layer on top of it, really cranking the blacks and jacking up the whites, as you see right now, to get uh, just the light faces. And then we paint into the clipping mask to create a little bit more form into this. Otherwise, it just looks too flat. But I think I like this rock a lot better. And the scale is working a lot better for us. I wasn't too happy with the scale of the other one. And we're getting close, color correcting it. I think the next thing we're going to do is is um, put a little right light wrap on this, flipping it, see how it looks. So this is what, this is what we're going to do is, for the light wrap, I duplicate the sky layer. And with all of its color adjustments, I duplicate it and I, uh, I flatten it out all into one layer. And I'll clip it onto 
the uh, the rock layer there and I'll paint into it so what that does is it takes the values of the sky that's right beside that rock and I paint using that and that creates a nice blending effect I can use again I can do the same technique I did with the fog I can sample that the the color that's around there and, and do that but um, this this way works as well just a different technique on doing it and I want a little bit more uh, fog and haze to cover up that mountain to create maybe a little bit more of a mysterious look so I'm painting into it with a, a cloud brush and I'm testing out to see where else I can do this but maybe not I just want it on that top side there to knock back that top side but we can still see the edges we can still uh, make out the forms and I think that's gonna do it I think we're almost done at least for this, I, I end up replacing that uh, side, the right side rock as well because I'm not too happy with it. But I noticed that uh, the sky was a little too high contrast, so I knocked that down. And uh, I think that's going to do for now until we jump to the next stage. All right, so we jumped ahead a little bit um, and finished this thing up. And the big difference here is this this left mountain here and I wasn't happy with the way uh, the other one was looking so I just went in there and grabbed another piece of reference did the same thing made a high contrast map brought it over and uh, placed it in there and color corrected it um, here's my layers right here so these are my color corrects I decontrasted it and then I took a little of the, the red out of it to cool it down a little bit and then used the same sky approach uh, that I did for this mountain here for a little bit of a light wrap and kind of softening out that edges to take away the contrast I needed contrast in that area and then uh, added a few, a few birds there just to give it a little bit more life every map painting uh, you could use birds um, so yeah so that's basically it I'm just gonna flatten this out I also took out the contrast in the sky uh, looking at some reference, my my uh, this, my sky had a little too much contrast, so I just softened it out by just picking a color and uh, taking a soft brush and just going over it like that, just to take out a lot of the contrast in there. And uh, I like it a lot better. So I'm going to flatten it, and I'm going to scale this down because it's really big right now, something a little bit more manageable. And then I'm going to throw a, a last uh, color correct here, just to brighten this up and then maybe pull the mids down just a little bit just to give it a little bit more contrast and pop yeah I think that's good enough flatten that down and I'm gonna do a little bit of a sharpen not too much just to bring out a little bit of the details there and yeah this is considered like I, I think this took me about uh, two and a half to three hours so it, it's not done. It's definitely not done. It's more, you know, something you can put together quickly, like a map painting sketch, a little bit more finished. But there's definitely a lot more we can do to uh, to get this really to sing. But for demonstration purposes, uh, I think the purpose of this was just to show you guys how you can mat out uh, objects or, you know, elements from photos, bring it in, clean them up, color correct them and to, to match each other and use reference to really get uh, a, a lighting scenario and mood into your map paintings.